Okay, so how did you come to realize that you didn't know that you didn't know you? Because I think that that is, I think that's going to resonate a lot for a lot of listeners. Honey, Mm. you don't want to do it the way I do. (laughs) Okay, listening audience, I'm going to be real, real. Y'all don't want to do it the way I did it, yeah. but I'm going to do tell you I how say I do it. Not as I do. Exactly. Yeah. Because I was alone, I was very lonely. Mm. I knew that there was something different. I didn't know what it was. And more importantly, I didn't know how to get to it. Mm. I found myself in a relationship and a, a series of relationships over a period of time, but I was always giving, giving, giving to the other person. I didn't know. I thought that was love, right? Uh, I thought that was what you do. And it is. But what I learned is you got to love yourself first. Why are you loving? Why are you giving love to this person? Why are you giving your everything to this person so that you have nothing for yourself? Mm -hmm. Right? So that was the way I lived with all of my relationships. I, I had four long-term relationships in my life Mm -hmm. and in each one of them I gave my all Mm -hmm. but then when it was over I felt so empty I felt I don't know why am I doing the same thing over and over one of the reasons that I say don't do what I did I I drowned my aloneness my loneliness Mm -hmm. and alcohol yeah yeah um I didn't realize in the beginning that I was on that slippery slope. Mm. I went to work. I came home. I went to work. I worked hard. Mm -hmm. I came home. I walked in the door. I kicked off my shoes. If any of y'all out there can hear yourself, just pay, pay, pay close attention. I kicked off my shoes. I went to the kitchen. I got a glass, got my little wine glass. I poured Chardonnay, which was my drink of choice. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to have one little drink. Mm-hmm. Now, mind you, being totally transparent, this little drink was a goblet. Yeah. Which was, <laughs> yeah. Which was a full goblet, right? And so I'll just have two drinks. Well, now that's a half a bottle. That's a half yeah, a liter. Might right? as well finish it off. Yep. And so over a period of time, I had just gotten into that habit, but I was telling myself, Mm -hmm. I can stop. I can Mm -hmm. stop anytime I want to. And I could stop initially anytime I want to. And then I realized one day I was at the university. I'm a retired professor, emeritus associate professor. And so I was at the university and I passed one of my colleagues in the hallway and I said to her, when are we going out drinking? And she said, give me a call and we'll set a time. And it was like, I stopped dead in my tracks Uh, because I realized I don't really know this woman, mm -hmm. but every time we talk, we're talking about going out drinking. And every time I talk, say something to her, it starts with, when are we going out drinking? Mm -hmm. That was so eye opening. Mm. Um, in that moment, I didn't, I didn't want to believe what I knew. Yeah. Because at that point, I also had gotten to the point of realizing that I could not stop drinking if I wanted to. Mm-hmm. Not anymore. Mm-hmm. There was a time that I could have, but I couldn't. Yeah. And what, after that, what I began to see happen is that the period between all of my boundaries began to be compromised. Mm. Initially, I would not drink before six o'clock. Mm. Then it was four. Mm. Then at two o'clock, my body is now craving alcohol. Right. Yeah. And at that point, I I didn't know when that shift had occurred, but once the shift occurs, you're there. You are fully Mm -hmm. actively an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what an alcoholic was. I thought it was a homeless person. I was Mm -hmm. not, um, you know, not to offend homeless people because I understand we all get have different circumstances, but I just thought it was somebody who was homeless or like when I was a kid, there was this lady, she and her husband lived across the street from us. They would get drunk on Friday and they would fight Friday and Saturday and then they'd go to work 
on Sunday, on Monday. Mm-hmm. Um, that wasn't me. Yeah. I was gainfully employed. I had two cars in my driveway. I had a nice two-story home. Um, I, you know, I am, I'm doing it from all outward appearances. Mm -hmm. I'm at the top of my game, but But inside, inside, totally, totally bankrupt, Mm -hmm. spiritually bankrupt, got nothing, right? And so when I realized that, then I, at that point, I made a decision. I'm going to stop drinking, but I couldn't hold the decision. I couldn't. Yeah, yeah it's an addiction. It's what, yeah, yeah, I couldn't will it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, every day I would say I'm not going to drink. And then I'd get, I, I, I live in the suburbs. So I take the train in, I get on the train and I'm now I'm thinking I'm going to go by the store. No, I'm not going by the store. I'm going to go straight home. Mm-hmm. And I, my car would drive to the store. Mm-hmm. One day I was in the store in Publix and the cashier said, uh, you drink a lot of Red Bull, which I was bad, bad, bad for you. But I was drinking, I was horrible to my body. Yeah. You know, self love is about loving all of you. Yeah, I was horrible. Yeah. And so she said, you drink a lot of Red Bull. You should consider uh, just buying it wholesale, right? And I thought, oh my gosh, she knows I drink a lot of Red Bull. She also knows that I drink wine a lot. So then I started doing, I didn't know that this was what alcoholics do. Mm-hmm. I started changing stores, changing yeah. location. Yeah. And then one night I was sitting in my home and I thought, I didn't drink and drive, but one night I was sitting in my home and I thought, I will, I can just drive through the store. It's only three blocks. And that was when I knew. I, I I have to do something. And so my sobriety date is July, um, July 12th, mm-hmm. July 17th, I'm sorry, 2012. I have been sober for nine years, just past yeah. July. I am grateful. Thank you. So yeah. it was hard journey the first year. That part of the story leads into how I became a life coach, because at the end of that first year in the program, I was looking for a goal. I got to have something. Otherwise, I get my, my mind is too active yeah it's gotta have yeah. something that's going to challenge me and so that took me into life coaching which then once i was in there the people the the um the instructors the other students there were only four of us and in four students and they were all women and um so they were all they all had a background in metaphysics and spirituality mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and i mm-hmm. didn't really but I had had some things happen early on in terms of seeing and knowing things. And in that, in that class, my gifts began to open up Mm. and very fortunately because of who my peers were, it was, I was supported. It was a safe space. Mm. It was a space where I knew that, no, you're not crazy because you are, hearing something or because you can see something about this person or because you can connect with them and finish their sentences you're not crazy Mm -hmm. because i was saying to myself hmm i hear voices schizophrenics hear voices right Uh, yeah yeah that's not yeah yeah Yeah. Claire, Not a Claire good audience. Thing. Claire audience. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you know that kind of one of the things I, I in after things begin to open up in that way with my my spiritual gifts, I did what we typically do or what I typically do. I just immerse myself in every modality that I could possibly mm-hmm. get to or find out about any kind of way. Uh, ultimately, though. What I might, my primary modality that I use now is synergistic energy healing. Mm -hmm. And what that is, I had no clue. People would ask me, well, what do you, what is this thing that you do? Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's it's just this thing that I do. This is not, and they say, well, it's not Reiki and it's not chronic. Well, no, I don't know what it is. But one night I had a dream and I, I don't even think it was a dream, but God said to me, synergistic healing, write it down. And I said, I remember, no, get up now and write it down. Yeah. And so I got up, I wrote it down. Good yeah. thing I did because I wouldn't have remembered. Um, <laughs> when I got up the next morning and I'm looking at it and I'm going, I don't even know what that is. Synergistic energy healing. 
I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm your Google girl. I was, yeah. I Googled it immediately. Not there. Did I just talk about that? Mm-mm. I found one woman who was doing it and she was in England. Hmm. One woman. And I listened to her and I said, oh my God, that's what I do. Uh, what it means mm-hmm. is that, you know, when you think of synergy, uh, when you bring use two things together, then you have uh, an impact that is so much greater than either of those things alone. Yeah. And so when I'm working with my clients, whether coaching or otherwise, or even doing Reiki, um, any energy healing, once I connect with them on that higher consciousness level, I can read them. Sometimes I act mm-hmm. as a, um, a medium mm-hmm. if the energy is good. Um, so I do all kinds of things that I don't market myself as psychic because that's mm-hmm. not the who that I choose to be. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm a synergistic healing in, healer in that whatever I, I see myself as like a hollow to read, whatever it is that God needs me to do, yeah. I have said, I made the commitment even verbally, I'm going to go where you tell me to go. I'm going to do what you, what you tell me to do. I'm going to say what you tell me to say. 